Welcome again. In this installment, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 8. We're going to be talking about the parable of the sower, the parable of the lamp on the stand, Jesus' mother and brothers. Hmm, what, we, what does he say about his family? Jesus calms the storm. Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. He casts out evil spirits. And Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. Let's start with verse 1. Soon afterwards, he went about through the cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of God's kingdom. With him were the twelve. Now, again, what is the good news of God's kingdom? We read over and over again, it is repent. In the Greek, it means to change your mind or change your heart, which comes from the original Hebrew, which means to turn back to God, to return to God. Okay? So to return to God, to change your mind, change your heart about the way you're living, about, about, uh, about your, you know, the, your, your view on sin uh, and, uh, and your view on righteousness and choose righteousness, to turn back to God. That is what God's, the good, the good news is, basically, that you can come in back into right standing with God. You can repent of all your sins. You can turn from all your sins. You can live a holy and pure life. God is able to do it for you. It's not some invisible you know, thing where the, I'm, clothed with the righteousness, I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ, but nobody knows it. No. When you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ, you shine like the sun and everybody will see your good works. Everybody will see your righteousness. You can't hide it. You can't hide the sun under a basket, okay? So with him were the twelve. A certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. So a demon here is an evil spirit, which is an actual entity. It's an actual uh, it's hard to say. Uh, it's an actual being that has its own thoughts, its own feelings, its own will, its own intellect. Okay? Uh, these are real and true actual beings. Okay? So Mary Magdalene had seven demons or evil spirits that had gone out from her. And Johanna or jo Joanna, the wife of Kuzas, that's Herod's st steward, Susanna, and many others who serve them, uh, the TR, uh, the Textus Receptus, reads him instead of them, from their possessions. So they served the Lord in, in, uh, with everything they had, with all of their possessions. They gave everything for God. Verse 4. When a great multitude came together and people from every city were coming to him, he spoke by a parable. Verse 5. So this is the words in red. These, this, these are Jesus' words. The farmer went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell among the, along the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock, and it was... And as soon as it grew, it withered away because it had no moisture. So the sun beat down on it. The shallow soil on the rock uh, dried up and, kill, and the plants died. Other fell among, among, amid the thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Other fell into the good ground and grew and produced 100 times as much fruit. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When his disciples asked him what, or excuse me, then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? He said, To you it is given to know the mysteries of God's kingdom, but to the rest in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And that is in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9. Now the parable is this. Okay, before I go on. 
See, Jesus made it clear that his people, that his disciples, were, they are the inside circle. They should be the ones that know these things, okay? So Jesus is like, I to, basically he's saying, I'm telling these parables, not so much for you, because you should know all these things anyway. I'm telling these parables because uh, I want the others to understand. I, I am so interested in teaching all of mankind. I'm so interested in reaching out to, to others who don't see, who don't know, who don't hear, who don't perceive, who don't understand. I'm so interested. I'm so dedicated to getting them educated uh, in, in the ways of God that I'm, I'm going to every length, every, you know, I'm going to every length that I can to do so. I'm, I'm making parables for them just so they can understand. The seed is the word of God. Those along the road are those who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart that they may not believe and be saved. Verse 13. Those on the rock are those who, are they who, when they hear, receive the word of God with joy. But these have no root who believe for a while, then they fall away into in time of temptation. Temptation here, another word of, for temptation is um, testing or persecution, you know, oppression, um, adversity. When adversity comes because of the word of God, they fall away. No, you need to be strong so that you don't fall away when people reject you, people say bad things about you, when people do all this stuff against you because of your belief in, in God and because of your preaching of God's word. Verse 14. That which fell among the thorns, these are those who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with, the, with cares, okay, worries, okay, riches. Hmm, see, riches. Riches can choke you choke your spiritual life and pleasures of life okay so the pleasures of life can maybe not such a good thing they it can choke out the word of god in your life and bring no fruit to maturity those in the ground in the good ground these are those who with an honest and good heart have heard the word Hold it tightly and produce fruit with perseverance. Verse 16. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a container or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand that those who enter in may see the light. Yeah, why would you have a light that is under a bowl or un, you know, and hide it? No, you put it up, you hit, you, it's on the ceiling, you know, you put it up high and so that everybody would avail themselves of the light. Verse 17, for nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Uh, oh, there's a good one. There's a good one. Jesus made it very clear, especially to the hypocrites, especially to those who like to show, make things look different than they really are. Hmm. Nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Wow. Think about that for a minute. If you really think about that and you really believe in that, you must repent of your hypocrisy. You must, you must stop living a lie. Hmm. Nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. What you're trying to hide? You're working against God because God's going to reveal it. Nor anything secret that will not be made, that will not be known and come to light. Verse 18. 
Be careful, therefore, how you hear, for whoever has, to him it will be given, and whoever doesn't have, from him will be taken away even that which he thinks he has. In other words, you're very responsible for what you hear. You're responsible. You're responsible for knowing. You're responsible for doing everything you can do with what you've got. Verse 19. His mother and brothers came to him. Oh, interesting. Jesus' mother, Mary, or his her real name would be Miriam. And, and his brothers came to him, and they could not come near him for the crowd. Some people told him, he said, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers stand outside. They want to they wanna see you, desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Ooh. Wow. He could have said, again, the evidence here is not so much in what he actually said, but what he didn't say. He could have said, oh, my mom is here. Oh, my brothers are here. Oh, make, make way for them. Uh, bring them up here. They, they bring them up here in front row. I want to talk to them. I, let, I want to talk to them, you know. Uh, excuse me for a minute. I got to go and talk to, to, the, to my mother and my brothers. He could have. Instead, he said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Think about that. How blessed would it be to be? How blessed would Mary be to be his mother? How blessed it would be to be one of the brothers of the Lord. His actual brother. How blessed would that be? Hey, man, my brother is Jesus. Really, I mean, really, my brother's Jesus. You know, we, we share DNA, closely share DNA here. Um, think about that for a moment. Think about that. He was saying, basically, if you want to be as blessed as his mother and his brothers, you are considered to be his mother and brothers. You are considered to be his family. If you just only hear the word of God and do it. Verse 22. Now, on one of those days, he entered into a boat, himself and his disciples, and he said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. A windstorm came down on the lake, and they were, they were taking on dangerous amounts of water. They came to him and woke him. Now think about this. Uh, this must have been a huge storm. Huge. Uh, this must have been a very violent storm. Um... And here he is sleeping. So verse 24, they came to him and awoke him and said, Master, Master, we are dying. <gasps> These are fishermen. They should know what a, you know, what a death uh, threatening, a life threatening, uh, excuse me, a life threatening storm looks like. They should know what a life threatening storm is. And to them, they were in a life threatening storm. And Jesus was sleeping. The storm didn't wake him up, but his disciples did. Huh. He woke and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and it was calm. Okay. It says here, see Psalm 107, verse 29. So let's go on over to Psalm 107, verse 29. Psalm 107, verse 29 says... He makes the storm a calm so that its waves are still. Hmm. This was like a thousand years before Jesus came on the scene. He makes the storm a calm so that its waves are still. There you go. A prophecy of what just happened there. We'll go back to Luke chapter 8. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are dying. And he awoke, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and it was calm. 
He said to them, where's your faith? Hmm. Being afraid, they marveled, saying to one another, who is this? Then that is that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. Hi, um, hmm, this is pretty, pretty powerful. Who is this then that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Like the winds and the water have, are able to understand Jesus. They are not only able to understand, but they are able to obey him. Wow. Verse 26, then they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, a certain man out of that city who had demons, again, this, these are evil spirits, not just personality defects. These are literal spirits that are inhabiting this man who had evil spirits for a long time and met him. He wore no clothes and didn't live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice, he said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, you son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. These demons were afraid. These evil spirits were afraid. Notice also they knew who Yeshua really was. They called him the son of the most high God. Uh, even the devils, even the evil spirits know more about Jesus or know him better than a lot of people do today, should I say that? How many people today actually know and believe that Jesus is the son of the most high God? These devils believed and knew that. It reminds me of the scripture in James, Yaakov is his real name, James, the book of James, where it says, you know, you believe there's one God? Good. Even the, even the devils believe that and tremble. You believe that, God, that Jesus is the son of the most high God? Good. What? So what? I mean, that is, even the devils believe that. Even the evil spirits know that. What makes you better than them? As I said many times before, you know, there are people who say, you know, I'm a Christian. Well, I, and you might say, well, how do you, how do I know you're a Christian? Well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I go to church. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again. I read my Bible. I pray. Even Satan, even the evil spirits, believe that God exists, believe that Jesus existed, you know, believe that he died on the cross, believe that he rose again, uh, goes to church. Yes, evil spirits <laughs> going to church, trust me. And they know the scripture and they pray. Yes, they do. We see it many times in the scriptures how the devil himself and his evil spirits, he, like here is one thing right here, speak directly to God. They pray, speak directly to Jesus. They pray into Jesus. They're speaking to him. It says that the, that the devil himself goes before the throne of God day and night, you know, accusing the brethren. He is constantly in communion with God. Check out Job. Check out times in Jesus' life where Satan himself spoke with Jesus and had a communication, a two-way communication. Uh, that which even a lot of Christians would love to have. So what makes you better than even the most evil of evils. There's only one thing that can separate you, that can really make you uh, set apart from, you know, the faith or the beliefs or the, the information that even the evil spirits have. That is repentance. That is that you obey God, that you really obey God, you love him, that you've repented, that you have changed your life and you really, really, really love and follow God according to his guidelines, instructions, rules for your life as we read throughout the Bible from cover to cover. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for Jesus was 
commanding the unclean spirit, this is in verse 29, to come out of the man. For the unclean spirit had often seized the man. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and fetters. Breaking the bonds apart, he was driven by the demon into the desert. Think about how strong this man was, breaking chains. You know, in another account, another gospel, it says that no one can even bind, no one can even bind him because he broke the chains so much. So um, this man was a very fearsome individual, uh, a very fierce individual, yet Jesus was so much more stronger that this man threw himself down and said, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most tough guy? Have you come to torment us right now? They were afraid. Verse 30, Jesus said, what's your name? He said, Legion, for we, for many demons have entered into him. They begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss, that is, into hell, more or less. Now there was there a herd of many pigs feeding on the mountain, and they begged him that he would allow them to enter into those. Then he allowed them. Again, why would the evil spirits, why would these devils beg Jesus to enter into pigs. A lot of, you know, these devils know a lot better than even a lot of Christians do today. They knew the law of God. They knew what was unclean according to God's sight. And they knew that a pig being unclean was fair game for the devils. They knew that a pig being unclean was fair game, legal ground, so to speak. Legal ground. That's why they knew that this, you know, this was fair game. This was legal ground for them. So they asked Jesus, send us into the pigs. And that's why Jesus allowed them. A lot of you, uh, those, those people who have evil spirits, um, for the most part, if not for, you know, in every case, they have evil spirits. They're tormented by evil spirits. They have evil spirits in their life uh, because they are they somehow opened the door or gave you know the devils or the devil legal ground in their life by disobeying God's commands. The devil knows how it works. You disobey God's commands according to the law of God, you open the door. And you give the devil access to your life. You make yourself fair game. You make yourself legal ground for him just to claim you. That's how it works. That's how it works. That's why when you repent of your sins, then a lot of times, uh, you know, the, de- the, the evil spirits will leave you. Uh, if not, you can ask the Lord to remove the evil spirits from you after you've repented of your sins. And then ask the Lord to fill you with his, with his own spirit. Verse 33. The demons came out of the man and entered into the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. They committed suicide. So we see here that suicide is the fruit of evil spirits. Devils cause people, and even animals to commit suicide. Verse 34, when those who fed them saw what had happened, they, f- they fled and told it in, in the city and in the country. So they were afraid. They were, astound- they were astonished. Verse 35, people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who saw it told them how he who had been possessed by demons was healed. All the people of the surrounding country of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were very much afraid. Then he entered into the boat and returned. Here we go again. We've got, we've got a situation here 
when Jesus was so powerful, so fearsome, so holy, they asked him, leave us, leave us. You are just too much. You're just too holy, too powerful. Okay? Another one, another, <laughs> another, you know, another exhibit in our case that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible is a lot different than the Jesus of most, if not almost every church today. Verse 38. But the man from whom the demons had gone out begged him that he might go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and declare what great things God has done for you. He went his way, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Hmm. So Jesus said, Return to your house and declare what great things God has done for you. He went away and proclaimed throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus had done for him. Verse 40, when Jesus returned, the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Behold, a man named Jairus, or Yaira, or Jairus, okay, came. He was, the, he was a ruler of the synagogue. We have departed so much, you know, from the, from the original faith, because nowadays Christians are so separate from Jewish synagogues. They need to go back to the roots. Jairus here, uh, again, his original name would have been Yairus or Yaira. Um, he was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come into his house. Hmm. So he was, he had enough, uh, he had guts, okay? Come into my house. <laughs> For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes pressed against him. A woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, uh, people speculate that could have been cancer, who had, who had spent all her living on physicians, she went to all the doctors and spent, a lot, spent all of her money, could not be healed by any, came behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, the tassel, it says here in, in the... Um, in the notes. For those of you who know, the word that's used for fringe or, ta or tassel is actually from the Hebrew word tzitzit, okay? Which is the, the tassels that is commanded for us to wear in the, the book of Numbers, okay? Uh, it's a tassel that, is, uh, that has a thread of blue in it. And it says that, that that tassel is to remind you to obey the commandments of God, okay? Even today, and talk about Jewish synagogues, even today, the tassel here, the seat seat, has a very special symbolic meaning. A very special, even if, it, if I can say prophetic meaning, uh, in the sense that it, it, it symbolizes the Torah itself. It symbolizes, when you, when you touch that friend, when you touch that tassel, uh, it it, it symbolizes your allegiance to God's law. It, dis, it symbolizes your repentance and your respect for God's word, for his, uh, for his Torah. Um, when this woman came up behind uh, Jesus and touched the seat seat, what she was doing is, in fact, in essence, she was saying, I repent of my sins. I turn away from all of my own desires in my life, my plans, everything that I am, everything that I stand for in, in myself, and I turn to God's way. I turn myself wholly and completely to God's way, and I surrender and respect, to, respect His commands, His law, His instructions, His rule, His Torah. That's repentance. That's repentance. Immediately the flow of her, of her blood stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? Now, again, let's just take a moment to think. Jesus wore seat seat. If he was here today, I'd be so bold to say he would wear seat seat. Why don't we today? If Jesus came today and was preaching and had a so-called church or 
whenever had a following, he would wear ZZ, and of course, the followers would follow along. You know, if you notice, usually a spiritual leader uh, dresses a certain way, and usually the followers would also dress in a similar way as the leader does. That's just the way it goes. Just a little thing to think about. When all denied it, Peter said to uh, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes press you and jostle you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I perceived that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, I guess she didn't want to be seen, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him. And how she was healed immediately. He said to her, Daughter, cheer up. Your faith has made you well. Shalom Aleichem. Go in peace. Peace to you. Verse 49. While he still spoke, one from the ruler of the synagogue's house came, saying to him, Your daughter's dead. Don't, tr don't trouble the rabbi. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. She's dead. Don't worry about it. She's dead. She died. It's over. But Jesus, hearing it, answered him, Don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be healed. When he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter in except Peter, James, and John. Peter, John, and James. Okay, so here we go again. And this, this happens over and over again throughout the scriptures and throughout the gospels where we have... Jesus allowing only Peter, John, and James with him in certain, in certain circumstances. Even the other nine were not eyewitnesses of what Peter, James, and John were eyewitnesses of. Okay, So again, when you're reading the scriptures, keep this in mind. Jesus, the words in red, of course, uh, that which, which can be uh, reasonably ascertained as being uh, truthful and factual uh, is, you know, uh, at the top. Peter, James, and John, the writings of Peter, James, and John are more weighty than any other writings because they are those that were part of the inner circle the inner of the inner circles of Jesus. They knew Jesus more than anybody else knew Jesus. They knew Jesus more than Thaddeus knew Jesus. They knew Jesus more than Judas knew Jesus. They knew Jesus better because they were allowed to be with Jesus in circumstances that no other person were allowed was allowed to be in. Okay? Consider the Mount of Transfiguration. Consider this in this circumstance and in others as well as we, as we read through this, uh, as we read through the Gospels. So the writings of Peter, James, and John, if you read it, think about this for a second. Just, just, just let me just put this uh, thought out there. Let me just submit this to you. Read the, do this in your, in your own personal Bible study. Read the writings of Peter, James, and John and you will find a common thread throughout all of them. They all speak of holiness. They all speak of righteousness. They all speak of following the law of God and sinlessness even. Now then read the other writings of the other disciples. So they, 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 it's, they're, the song, the tune is, is, is different. Why? Because they're different people. They were not as close to the Lord as, uh, as Peter, James, or John was. Even the writings of Paul. You know, there's a common thread throughout the writings of Paul, which is different than the common thread throughout the writings of Peter, James, and John. Consider this, okay? We need to come to the scriptures with an open mind, but not with an empty mind. We need to know. We need to be educated. We need to know what we are reading, what authority it actually has, who wrote what we are reading. I have, a, I have a video, uh, a teaching called, uh, you know, the 10 questions to ask. The questions to ask when reading the Bible. Uh, I encourage every one of you to, uh, to check that out. So he didn't allow anybody else to come in except Peter, John, and James, the, and the father of the child and her mother. All were weeping and mourning, but he said, don't weep. She isn't dead, but sleeping. 
But they ridiculed him. Ah, he's crazy. What are you mocking him? What does he mean? She is, we know she's dead. We know she's dead. We all know she's dead. So they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside. Get out of here. I don't want to hear it. And taking her by the hand, he called saying, Child, arise. Arise. Verse 55, her spirit returned and she rose up immediately. He commanded that something be given her to eat. It's important to eat when you're hungry, right? And many times that's the way the Lord looked at it. Verse 56, her parents were amazed, but commanded, but he commanded them to tell no one what had been done. Again, here we are, the meek and lowly, the humble Jesus who did not seek to be in the spotlight. Just shh, be quiet. Don't tell anybody of this great miracle. That concludes the reading of Luke chapter 8. So go your way and be incredibly blessed as God enlightens the eyes of your heart, your mind, and gives you wonderful, wonderful insight and revelation into his word and into the mighty scriptures of the Lord, the words of heaven, the words of life. Thank you.